always comes. Now, as a believer, every pain you have, God is trying to teach you something with that. And the question is, are you going to learn from it or not? You know, some people just, well, I got this pain, and they complain about it, and all you hear is the complaints and so forth. Okay. On the other side, people go, hmm, I had this pain. What did I do to get this pain? How can I avoid getting this pain in the future? And they uh, don't happen again. Like uh, David back here, he decided to kind of go drive his vehicle, bicycle where he wasn't supposed to go, and it crashed. Well, he learned, you know, don't drive his bicycle there anymore. And um, I encouraged him to get back on that bicycle and go. His mom was saying, well, you got to have somebody there. Well, he'll be okay, Mom. He's a tough man, young man. But he's learned, don't go through a culvert again. Watch out for those culverts. I tell you, I remember I was playing football with my buddies, and we were right next to this apartment complex, and I ran into a, a brick wall, literally. And so I got back up, dust myself off, and we're starting to play some more, and my mother shows up. You can't get more embarrassing. I mean, you're playing. I would go, bleed that, that, that's fine. No, you got to go home right in front of the other guy. She made me go home because I ran into the brick wall. Well, I just broke it in one place. The brick wall was okay, you know. It's fine. You know, I, I've got a different definition of pain for you. Pain is a warning light letting you know there's something wrong. You may have not heard that definition before. Pain is a warning light letting you know something's wrong. Such as you get an infection in your body, and you're not right and so forth, you've got to go check it out, and you find out something really bad. And if you hadn't checked it out, maybe you didn't, wouldn't live very long, but because you checked it out, you live longer. And ignoring, you know, you get a warning light in your vehicle. You know, it's a red light. I can't tell you how many people back when I used to own a mechanic shop would say, well, the, the red light came on about water and I drove it to your shop. <laughs> no. You turn it off. You park on the side of the road. You call the wrecker. Mm -hmm. Because now instead of paying $100 to fix it, it's $2,000 because you warped your cylinder heads. You know, so you got to park your car when the red light comes on. So when your red light comes on in your life, you need to say, whoa, what am I doing? Now, there is a yellow light. And I get this yellow light that tells me it's time to change oil. Okay. I can, I can put that off a little bit, but I need to go ahead and change that because I've got you know, like 254,000 miles on my vehicle. And it's still going. It's paid for. Yeah. I'm going to try to get to 300,000. We'll see if I make that. Uh, but, you know, you never know. It may just say, I'm, I'm done. Uh, but when that light comes on, I know I can put it off just a little bit, but I know I still need to do it to keep it going. But that red light, I mean, you better get that thing done. Well, there's red lights that happen in your life and also some of those caution lights in your life. And, you know, sometimes God's warning us with some pain, saying, hey, you better wake up or you're going to have a problem. Or the problem's right here, you know. It's knocking on the door. Think about what God does. He uses pain, what, for my good. See, we think, well, I don't like, pain's not good. Yeah, it is good. It gets your attention. Sometimes God's got to hit us with a stick in the head to get our attention. And I can use pain to help me move further in my life. Why I'm not stuck. And God uses pain, what? For me to help other people. Because God doesn't waste to hurt. When I have a pain, and I go through a difficult situation, and I come out of it, I realize God's power helped me through it, and somebody else then comes along with the same pain, same problem. I can come along them and help them through their pain. So a few things. God uses pain to guide and direct me. God uses pain to guide and direct me. 
Guide is more general. Direct is more specific. You know, guide is when, okay, you've got that orange light on, it's kind of getting your attention a little bit, okay, I I know I need to do something. But when he directs me, it's that you better do something about that now. Don't put it off. In Proverbs 16, 9, a person may plan his own journey, but the Lord directs his steps. You know what, I've learned this. You realize all the way through the Bible it tells us to plan, to organize, and get ready. I have yet, now I pray over the plans to get everything right, I have yet for the plans to go as I designed. Because God always changes the plan. Well, God, why would you have me plan if you're going to change it? Because he's God and that's what he wants us to do, so you plan. You organize. Now, sometimes he uses some of the plan, but most of the time he just changes it all up. But that goes, you've got to listen. Because just because you've made a plan doesn't mean that's what you've got to do. You've got to listen because the Holy Spirit, or things change, and you've got to move and go that direction instead of your own way. And Job 36, verse 15. God teaches people through suffering and uses distress to open their eyes. Has that ever happened to you? It happens, yes. You think about this. See, we got a horse person right here. The bit in the horse's mouth, is it for the horse's comfort or for you? (laughs) Definitely for the rider. Because you pull on that and the horse goes, "Mm, I don't like that. I best I better go this way. I don't want to get tugged there again. So actually that discomfort is for the rider, not the horse. The horse would just soon spit it out and do its own thing. I want to go back to the barn. Yeah, I want to go back to the barn and eat some more feed. Yeah, but no, you want to go on a ride. You want to go somewhere. The believers in Corinth had some pain. And Paul said this to them in 2 Corinthians 7, 9. Now, I'm glad, not because it hurt you, but because the pain turned you to God. So when that pain comes on, it directs us back to God, and it opens our ears so we really listen to the Holy Spirit, and we can make changes. Now, sometimes pain is our own cause, and sometimes it's somebody else is doing something to us, and sometimes life just happened like a culvert gets in your way, Right? You know, you weren't playing on the culvert, but it got there and it smacked you upside of the head. I, you know, I smacked into a brick wall. That's just life. But sometimes it's just life happens. But what's really bad is when it, we do it to ourselves and then we go, why did I do that? That's, but see, God is with us through all of that. In Psalms 119, verse 71, it was the best thing that could have happened to me for it taught me to pay attention to your laws. Now, who wrote that? David. David, a man after God's own heart, whose sins are well recorded in the passages of Scripture. And he goes, yeah, I had some pain from it, but I learned from that pain. C.S. Lewis wrote this, God whispers in our pleasure, but he shouts to us in our pain. It's like pain is a megaphone. Wake up! Do what I want you to do. Now, second there, God uses pain to goad and correct me. Now, you say, well, goad, that sounds like an old English word. Well, it is. When you want to goad somebody, you kind of push them into action. When I was growing up, I was the world's premier procrastinator. You know, if there was something to do, well, yeah, I could eventually get around to it, and I could do it, but I just would procrastinate. But then when God called me to preach and I went to college, I realized if I procrastinate, I'm going to flunk out. So procrastination ended. And that taught me, you know, one of the reasons I think God sent me to college to prepare me for ministry so I wouldn't procrastinate. Because when you, I got there, I had to learn not to. It retrained me. So now if I got to do something, I get it done. Just like 
You know when I start working on my sermon? Monday. I don't wait till Saturday night and say, oh, what do we think? What do we want to preach tomorrow? You know what a Saturday night, we call that among pastors, that's a Saturday night special. What does a Saturday night special gun do? It kills you, right? No cheap gun. A Saturday night special sermon, it just kills everybody. You know, what was that? I want you to know pain is a catalyst for action, for doing. And sometimes God we've got to push us with a little pain, go to some pushes to get us going. In Proverbs 20, verse 30, uh, I like this verse. Sometimes it takes a painful experience to make us change our ways. Uh, anybody got a testimony to that? Yeah, that pain comes, you go, I don't want that again. When's the last time you went to see the dentist? Did you go, do you, you have a regular dental appointment? Yeah, where well you go and check it out. You know what the majority of people do? They wait until they got a toothache and go, I got to do something about it, I can't eat. And they finally go to the dentist because they've been putting off getting their teeth cleaned regularly, maintained. They go wait until they got a major pain, and then they go to the dentist, and then they get a huge bill, and it winds up costing more than if they went regularly and got their teeth done. But that's how people are. They, and they'll call the dentist. I, I've got a, a friend that manages dental practice, um, and um, people will call the dentist's office, and it goes to their answer machine, and they'll call it 11 o'clock at night. I need a dentist, my tooth hurts. <laughs> I'm sorry, you can go to the emergency room, but they're not going to do anything. Mm-mm. Do you know the, correct, the difference between correction and punishment? Big difference. Punishment is for something that was done in the past. Discipline, which is correction, is for the future. That's why God doesn't punish. You go, what? God doesn't punish? No, he doesn't. God loves you. He cares for you. He doesn't punish you. But he disciplines. See, discipline is to correct you so you won't choose the wrong path. You'll be going in the right direction. That's discipline because it's corrective in nature. Punishment is just, well, I beat you up, and so that's what it is. I'm not going to teach you anything, but other than I'm stronger than you, and I can beat you up. That's useless. Discipline is to direct you in the right path so that you will be much more effective and you won't make that step. You know, I know my mother, quote, spanked me when I was a little kid because when I got older, I, when she would spoke, I always would do what she said, right? But what I didn't like was talking. I'd rather just get a whip and get it over with. No, she would talk and say, and that's the same thing my grandfather and grandmother did. I mean, th th there was no threats or anything. We'd have to sit down and talk and have to explain why I made a dumb decision. I didn't want to explain why I made the decision. I just wanted to get out and get it over with. But see, discipline is corrective. It helps us change our path. In Hebrews 12, verse 8, God corrects all of his children, and if he doesn't correct you, then you really not, don't belong to him. Did you realize that? If God doesn't discipline you, you say, I'm a believer, but I'm heading in the wrong direction, then you're not his child if he doesn't correct you. God corrects us for our own good because he wants us to be holy as he is. So God doesn't punish, he disciplines us to correct us to get us on the right path. Now, I've told you before, I've been to God's woodshed. I've only been there one time, I'm not going back. The world would say I was doing right, but God, I was going the wrong direction. But what I encountered was not hateful, mean, you know, ogre God, no. I met love. And the more you realize God is love. It, it's like he was talking to me without talking. You know, here God is, he's love, and you encounter him, and you've messed up. I'm not going back there again, never. I want to see him face to face, not when he needs to correct me, but when he wants to just love me. That's what I want. 
and Job 15, verse 17. Consider yourself fortunate. God's all-powerful chooses to correct you. So the all-powerful God who could simply think of just destroy you in a second or cause you miserable life, but instead he just corrects you, disciplines you. Why? That means he loves you. If he doesn't dis, you know, you know, when you go out to the store, sometimes you see some kids, I mean, climbing up on the TVs, climbing on this and that, and their parents are standing there going, whatever, and the kid over here, do you run over and spank the kid? No, because then they would throw you in jail. You discipline your own kids. You don't discipline somebody else's. That doesn't go very good. You think about the prodigal son. He was prideful and arrogant and said, Dad, I want my inheritance now. He says, okay, here it is. And he goes down to Jerusalem Sunset Strip and wastes the money on wine, women, and song. It's all gone. And then he winds up feeding pigs which is the last thing a young Jewish man would want to do is even be near a pig, and he's got to feed the pig, and he wants to eat what he's feeding the pigs, and he would never eat that normally, but he can't eat it because he's got to feed the pigs. You talk about a terrible state. So in Luke 15, verse 14, the prodigal son says, he spent everything he had and was hungry. You know, one thing that gets our attention is being hungry, doesn't it? Yes. At last he came to his senses. You know, sometimes God's got to go to us, correct us, give us pain. Then we, oh, I, the light comes on finally. And said, I'll go up and go to my father. He says, I'm going to change my ways. I'm leaving this life where I'm at. I'm going to go eat crow and go back to my father's house. You know, who's the most motivated salesman? The ones that are the hungriest. The one that needs to put some food on the table. It makes me, remind me of a friend of mine, his nine-year-old son decided he didn't like what was in his lunch bucket. <laughs> and so he didn't eat anything for lunch. And he came home and his mom was there. He said, Mom, I'm hungry. She said, why are you hungry? Well, I didn't eat. She said, because there's, your stomach hurts because there's nothing in it. Well, a little while later, his dad came home and said, oh, my head hurts. And the little boy says, well, Mom says that's because there's nothing in it. <laughs> Hebrews 12, verse 7. Let God train you, for he's doing what any loving father does for his children. Whoever heard of a child who was never corrected. You know, if you don't correct your children, what happens? They wind up in a wrong path. Now, now Jim Grice, that's Marva's husband, he told me multiple times, if you don't get their attention by the time they're two years old, you're raising monsters. You, you'll, you'll never, you'll have discipline problems forever. You got to get their attention. So God sometimes allows us a lot of pain he wants to go to us, cause it, why? To correct us. And third, God uses pain to gauge and inspect me. Mm. To gauge and inspect me. In other words, what does he want to do? He wants to test our character. You know, people are like tea bags, you realize that? You don't know what's inside them until you put the heat on them. And once the heat on, all this kind of stuff comes out. It's what's in comes out. That's why when somebody says something really dumb, oh, that wasn't me. Oh, yes, it was, and everybody knows it. <laughs> and God's expecting us every morning, every mo moment, every minute, whatever it takes. In Jeremiah 17, 10, the Lord searches our hearts and examines our deepest motives. See, God knows our motives. Now, you may do something stupid and people, oh, you did it wrong. But see, God knows your heart. If your heart's right, God will work with that. So he can give to each person the right reward according to his deeds. How he 
has lived. So what does God do? He tests us. He inspects us. He checks us out regularly. He knows our heart, our motives, and our intentions, our heart. So therefore, whatever actions you're doing is simply an outgrowth of what you're thinking. You know, you don't, you think before you act. You know, you don't decide what you can do in a heated moment. You've already decided that a long time ago. In Isaiah 48, verse 10, I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. You realize pain tests our character, pain tests our commitment, and pain tests our faith. What's your character? It's who you are when nobody else is around. You know, people say, well, I've got a great reputation. I've got great integrity. Well, that's what you are to everyone else. But who are you when nobody else is around? What actions you take when nobody else can see what you're doing, that's your character. So God allows the heat of life to come up and burn off our impurities. Just like if you want pure gold, you've got to heat it up. Or any precious metal, you've got to heat it up and get rid of the dross, the stuff that's no good, so you get to the good stuff. And God does that to us. He says, I'm going to heat you up so the bad stuff gets out and the good stuff rises to the occasion. And James 1, verse 2 through 3, tests and challenges come to you from all sides. Now, I've experienced that. You go, where is all this coming from when you're going through a trial? Yep, all sides. And you know that under pressure, your faith is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So, so much people are concerned about their image and their reputation. That's what other people are seeing. Your character is who you really are. And God knows what you are. So make sure that character shines before him. You know, there shouldn't be any difference between your public and your private life. It should just all be the same. And a lot of times your faith is measured by your reaction to the pain. Do you continue in it or you go a different direction? In Deuteronomy 8.2, let me put it this way. God led through the wilderness for 40 years, humbling and testing you to find out how you would respond or whether or not you really obey him. You know, why in the world do they walk 40, mile, 40 years in the wilderness? Now, I've been to the Middle East. I mean, I can walk from Cairo, if I probably have to have some bodyguards with me, <laughs> but, but you could walk from Cairo, Egypt, over to Jerusalem. And it's not a long walk. Why do they spend 40 years in the wilderness? Because every time they, God gave them a test, what happened? They failed the test, and God said, well, take another lap around the desert. <laughs> they kept on going around and going around. They kept on failing the test. Four, God uses pain to guard and to protect me. God uses pain to guard and protect me. This is a wonderful thing. We really don't realize what difference this makes, but it does. In Psalms 91, verse 3, God will save you from hidden traps. You say, well, what are hidden traps? Satan has traps all over the world to try to ensnare you and to take you away from God's purpose for your life. And some of Satan's traps are good things. And yet... You can do good things or you can do the best thing. And so he tries to snare you and pull you away. A terrible statistic I heard this past week that for the first time, the majority of Christians, I mean, excuse me, the majority of the American population, when asked if they have a faith, their answer was they do not have a preferred faith. Less than 50%. You know, that used to be 90% did, now it's less than 50%. That's why we as believers need to make sure we're penetrating the world we're in, make a difference where we are. In Job 36, verse 16, 
God has led you away from danger, given you freedom. You know, sometimes that pain that comes along is to guard you from doing something really dumb. You know, it's kind of like, like, like there's a force field around something stupid and God puts it there and you go, whoa, I better back up from this, it's going to hurt me. You know, fever warns you of infection, so we get warnings. A small pain can cause you to warn you about something greater. You know, a little pain in your chest, like, you realize, they always tell you, I've been told this many, many times, if you have a pain in your chest or in your arm, you better go to the hospital right away. Well, before my heart attack, I only had a little pain up here in my shoulder. That was it. It felt like just a pulled muscle, not knowing that's where my main artery it was, or is. Yeah, it's still there. <laughs> got, it got replaced somewhat, but my main artery's right there, and it was hurting because it couldn't get the blood flow. I didn't know, but it caused me to call my doctor and say, hey, I need to come see you. And I've told some of y'all this, but you know, so I, I drove from here over to Montgomery, 45 minutes. See, that's 70 miles an hour driving. Walk across the concrete parking lot. Sit down in my doctor's patient room, and he comes talking to me. Next thing I know, he slapped me upside the head. I go, why are you slapping me upside the head? Because you had a heart attack. Your face went ashen. And then when I saw him last week, for the first time, I said, yeah, last time I saw you slap me, he said, yeah, that's after I pounded on your chest to get your heart going again. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So then the, the ambulance came, took me to the hospital, all that. So, yeah, then I had quadruple bypass surgery. Yeah, you don't want that, no. They, they, they checked me and said, we, and they, uh, we all thought they could do stents, and they did that heart catheterization and said, no stents for you, buddy. It's a cabbage. I said, I don't like cabbage. <laughs> it's cabbage with a V, not a B. It's, it's a necrostic for doing quadruple bypass surgery. So that little pain up here saved my life as a result. But God many times saved my life along the way. So you don't know what that pain may be preparing you for. You think about pain. In the Bible, there's a man named Joseph in the Old Testament in Genesis. And what happened for his first 40 years? I mean, everything went wrong. He was the youngest brother. I mean, they didn't like him because father made him chieftain, and they were all older. I mean, the oldest one's supposed to get chieftain, not you, you little runt. And so they th throw him into a pit. They were going to let him die, and they said, oh, let's make money on it, you know good Jewish guys, we're going to make some money. So they pulled him out and sold him into slavery. And uh, then he gets falsely accused of rape, gets thrown into prison. So in the prison, he winds up running the prison. And then he helps, gets two guys their vision. What's going to happen? He said, one of you is going to be restored, the other one's going to die. But the one that got restored forgot about him. And then finally, after all those years, he gets thrust forth and he becomes the prime minister of Egypt, the grand vizier. And he saves the world because God gave him a vision of what the Pharaoh had seen. Seven years of plenty, seven years of famine, you better get ready. And then his brothers come calling. Hmm. Payback time, right? They're here coming with their sacks empty and they need grain, they're going to die without it. Mm-hmm. They put me through 40 years of trouble. Payback, right? No. Genesis 50, verse 20. You intended, intended to harm me. So he's reminding them, hey, this was wrong. You did it to me. But God intended it for good. See, he didn't know. He, would, he had to go to... 40 years of training to be the prime minister of Egypt to save the world, he didn't realize that all he went through was preparation for a greater position. And a lot of times we're going through a difficult time. We don't know what's going on. God's preparing us for the next step up. But we don't know that, but God knows that. 
It's amazing. Here he told them again and again, hey, I'm, I'm taking care of you, moves them there. When their father dies, where did he go? Oh, please don't kill us. He said, I'm not going to do that. I, I'm not like others who want vengeance. That, that's up to God to settle that with you. I'm here to be a blessing. In John 13, verse 7, Jesus replied, You don't realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Later you'll understand. See, they didn't understand. See, they thought Jesus was going to set up his kingdom. That's why John and James, Hey, I want to be on your left hand, your right hand, when you come in glory. In other words, the two key leaders with him when he came in glory. He said, well, That's already been assigned. They didn't know they were asking to be on the left side and the right side on the cross between Jesus, with Jesus in between them. They didn't know that's what they were asking. They thought they were looking at power. Jesus said, you don't understand, but you will later. So that pain gets our attention, moves us forward. And five, God uses pain to grow and perfect me. To grow and perfect me. Margaret Clarkson wrote a book several years ago called Grace Grows Best in the Winter. Grace Grows Best in the Winter. What does that mean? We think grace will go best in the sunshine, everything rosy, everything great. But when you're going through your most difficult times, it's when you really understand grace more and your roots of your salvation, of your strength, of your maturity goes deepest during the hard times, not the good times. It's easy to enjoy the good times. Everything's going right. Everything's lovely. But when you're going through that, that narrow path, that the, the valley, and you find God is with you through the darkest valley, and your faith is strengthened and empowered as you go through that. So he's using that pain to grow us and perfect us. In James 1.4, For when the way is rough, your patience has a chance to grow. Now I'm going to tell you this, I never ask God to give me patience. I figure he'll give me all I need. I don't want any extra. <laughs> For when the way is rough, your patience has a chance to grow. So let it grow. And don't let it squirm out of your problems. See, a lot of times we just want to get out of the problem we're in. We're going to pain. God, just get me out of this pain. God says, no, I'm going to leave you in that pain because you've got to learn something in that pain. And then you'll be ready for anything. See, after you've been fully tested through the pain, then you're ready for greater things, not before. Strong in character, full and complete. God says, I want you complete, prepared, accomplishing everything I want. I don't want you just to squirm out of some trial just to get some relief. No, I want you fully tested and ready. One of my favorite authors is J.I. Packer, tremendous theologian who passed away just a few years ago. And he wrote this. God uses chronic pain and weakness along with other inflictions as he chisels for sculptures our lives. It deepens our dependence on Christ for the strength each day, and the weaker we feel, and the harder we lean, the stronger we grow spiritually. You know, so many times we just want to hit an eject button like we're a fighter pilot. Get me out of this plane that's blowing up. No. God wants you to walk through that pain so you'll be stronger. And James 1.4, so don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed. You know, you don't know what you need until Jesus is all you have. And then you realize Jesus is all you need. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.9. See, I'm going to do a four-week series about pain. 
This happened so that we might learn to trust not in ourselves, but in God. You realize pain is inevitable? It's not an option. Pain is part of life. And it's going to come on you when you least expect it. And it tends to be what we would consider the worst time. It's kind of like something ugly. Show. Where did that thing come from? Everything was rosy and great. I was on my way to something great and boom. And you go, okay, I've got to deal with this. In Galatians 3, 4. Has all your painful experiences brought you nowhere? See, it's a question. Paul was asking, hey, you've had some painful experiences, the church in Corinth. Have you learned anything from it? So we need to learn from those experiences. So you look back, okay, I've learned that. I'm not going to do that again. You realize pain turns some people into saints that accomplish great things, and sometimes pain turns people into devils and dictators. You know, you can have people in the same group, and one reacts one way to pain, one reacts totally different. You know, some become great Christian leaders and some dictators hurting other people. What's the difference? How you choose to respond to the pain. Do you become bitter or better? It's your choice. You, I've, I've encountered people, they had something happen 50 years ago. And they talk about it just like it was just yesterday. Well, when did that happen? Oh, that's 50 years ago. And you're still rehearsing that pain over and over again? Move on. I learned from that pain, I'm going to move on to something better with my life. Jesus doesn't explain the way our pain. He joins in with us. He says, come to me, all of you with heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy. My light is load. So he doesn't abandon us. He comes alongside us and helps us with our load. In 1 Peter 4, 19, If you're suffering according to God's will, keep doing what is right and trust yourselves to God, who made you, for he will never fail you. So sometimes we're suffering and we go, I'm suffering because I did exactly what God wanted me to do. So why am I suffering? God says, keep right on going. You're doing the right thing. I'm preparing you for greater things. Look again, look again once more in 1 Corinthians 1, nine. This happens so you might learn to trust not in ourselves, but in God. Trust in Him. The eminent psychiatrist Scott Peck, he wrote in The, the Road Less Traveled, he said, Fearing pain because we fear pain. He went further. Almost all of our, our greater or lesser degree our attempt to avoid pain causes us to procrastinate and results in more pain. See, when you put it off and you don't deal with it, when pain comes along, sometimes we just, you know, we think, well, I'll just ignore it and it'll go away. Does pain go away? No. It's that flashing red light on your dashboard saying, do something now. And he says further that this tendency to avoid problems and the emotional pain that's inherent in them is the primary basis for human mental illness. That's quite something to consider. When you avoid it at all costs, you don't want to talk about it, you don't want to deal with it, it winds up what? In depression and causes you greater problems. That's why what do you need to do first? You need to make sure you know Jesus as your Savior. Why? Because the reason we don't get punishment, instead we get discipline, because Jesus took all of our sins, all of our punishment upon himself at the cross. So we don't need to deal with punishment. Jesus already paid for it. Why do that again? That's double jeopardy. God disciplines us so that we can go on greater heights and accomplish great things. I want to challenge you 
to deal with those warning lights in your life when they come up. And with God's help, you'll be stronger because He'll walk with you through those. And what happens, your faith will get stronger. You'll know His voice better. And you'll be able to do what He wants you to do because you know it is not on your strength you're doing things, but on His. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You that You don't give up on us. You bring us through whatever pain that we have in life. And we know that others many times don't realize that the pain we're going through is for our good, nor do we, but you do. And you use it to perfect us, to inspect us, and to protect us from something worse. You lovingly watch over us. You carried that old rugged cross up to Golgotha, and you died for us. Therefore, you've taken our bad or ugly things and painful and shameful things and nailed them to the cross. Help us to grow strong and vibrant as we follow you every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand for this time of invitation, inviting you to come to know Christ.